Well, the last overdose happened as early as this morning, and all of these overdoses happened on the Northeast Avalon. These men and women believe that they're smoking, snorting, and injecting heroin and other opioids. But early indicators point to another deadly drug, fentanyl. Now, these drugs have been sent to a police lab for testing, but it's suspected fentanyl could be involved. Some people were picked up by ambulance, others were dropped off at the emergency room, and the Oxone kits have been used in some of these cases to reverse the effects of an overdose. We would normally see um, uh, intentional overdoses. We see a lot of those. Um, but what's different about this group is um, the patients are all v giving very similar stories uh, with respect to what they've used, uh, and they seem to be all accidental overdoses, which is, uh, which is a little bit uh, out of the ordinary for our population here in the city. Mm -hmm. Now, early indications makes it seem like this is just a bad batch of drugs, but again, that can't be confirmed until those test results come back. But the other health authorities are not experiencing these problems. But tonight, the province's health minister is weighing in. Inevitable, given what had been happening across the rest of the country, and we've tried our best to be as prepared as we can for it. And I think... Uh, uh, the important thing from my point of view is that the, uh, the paramedics uh, in Eastern Health uh, were, were ready, as ready as anyone can be for this. Now, the RNC RCMP's joint drug team is investigating, but until then, police and health officials are telling the public to stay safe and be vigilant. Now, the health authority is also reminding people that take home naloxone kits are available, and it could mean the difference between life or death. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland in St. John's. A young man scrambled to escape this burning cabin on the Bonavista Peninsula overnight. Firefighters say he woke up around midnight to find his cabin ablaze. A wood stove had melted the plastic on the walls, which then caught fire. When he couldn't put the fire out himself, he rushed to a relative's house and called the fire department. By the time a crew arrived, the place was fully lit. It took 15 firefighters about three hours to extinguish the fire. Area residents are now helping the young man find clothes and a place to live. Well, some people who work in the crab industry held a protest in St. John's this morning. A handful of pl fish plant workers demonstrated at the offices of Workplace NL. Many of them say they suffer from crab asthma and they want a council created to deal with health and safety issues in processing plants. Crab asthma is a condition that results in breathing problems caused by working closely with snow crab. Memorial University outlined its bleak financial situation at a, t a town hall meeting in St. John's today. The university is facing rising costs on all fronts. There's crumbling infrastructure and it can't even afford to fix the lights that keep dimming at the performance hall at the School of Music. At today's public meeting, members of the audience were given a chance to ask questions. And some of them, especially international students, gave Mun Brass an earful. Here now, Cease Hare was at the meeting. He's joining us now. So Cease, what is the university saying? Memorial University says money is tight. The plant is in pathetic shape. Cuts have been made and more cuts are likely and services will be affected. Almost every seat in the 300 seat theater, lecture theater on campus today were taken during the hour and a half long town hall. Uni University Brass focused on how much it costs to run the place and what it needs to spend just to keep MUN running the way it is now. Staff cuts have been made, future cuts are anticipated, services we're told will be impacted and things could get a lot worse if something doesn't change soon. We can't operate like this right now. At some point, does the province want to engage in a conversation about, should we give up research? Should we go become a small teaching college? Should we give up Grenfell campus? I mean, honestly, are those questions, uh, they're questions that people are afraid to talk about, I think. 
Now, some students who were at the town hall asked the administration about expensive meals in fancy restaurants and the cost of fees for headhunters. Gulfman says considering that MUN operates in a national and global environment, those costs are not only necessary and reasonable, they're not excessive. Now, it was the international students who stole the show during this town hall meeting. They dominated the microphones, asking the university about why they feel that they're being mistreated. They say they get a sense that Munn has tried to fix its money problems in the past on their backs by increasing fees, tuition fees for them and not others. That leaves us thinking, are we being treated as cash cows? Absolutely, we are. For the reasons that we, uh, we don't have ser the services that we need as international students transitioning into this province, uh, we are receiving exactly the same education as Canadian students and we pay 3.5 times more. And one thing is certain in all of this, there are no easy solutions for Memorial's financial woes. They either cut costs or they raise more money by increasing student fees and tuition. The next step in Munn's budgetary process is the Board of Regents meeting in early May. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Now, Munn President Gary Kachanowski began today's forum by addressing allegations from the provincial government that the university has been falsifying financial reports. Minister of Advanced Education Jerry Byrne made those allegations to local media Tuesday, but today Kachanowski refuted them. These are serious allegations that call into question the integrity of the financial administration of the university and that we believe are completely unfounded and not correct. Let me be clear. I have complete confidence in the integrity of our professional financial services team. Well, a man is facing court action for what police call a case of online criminal harassment. It's alleged that for months, the 44-year-old used Facebook and phone calls to claim someone had committed serious criminal acts. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary says he made those allegations to the employer of the alleged victim. Police say he now faces charges of criminal harassment and defamatory libel. He's been released to appear in court on June 8th. There's a food recall to tell you about tonight. It involves Belbin's Grocery in St. John's. The company says there's been an incident involving the safety of food it prepared for some catering clients earlier this month. The recall involves a string of products prepared at the store, including sandwiches and meals. The food was prepared between April 15th and the 21st. People who receive products from those dates are asked to either throw out the food or return it to the store. Belbin says it is their first food recall in 74 years of operation. The problem has been fixed and the company says the recall is an added precaution. There is a warning from emergency services officials tonight about some nasty weather about to hit parts of the province. And to give us the details, Ryan's back. So Ryan, what is coming and what area of the province is in its path? Well, a pretty good look here, Debbie, with Environment Canada's warnings that are in place. It's freezing rain that is the issue, and we've been talking about this threat uh, over the last couple of days. And again, it's the same area from Bonavista Bay through Central towards the higher elevations of Cornerbrook. I think Cornerbrook itself, uh, not really much of an issue, but the higher terrain in the Cornerbrook region is certainly going to be prone to some significant icing. And then the Northern Peninsula and the Straits as well. And as we take a look at the forecast model projection, anything in that 10 to 20 millimeter range is, we're starting to talk about the potential for some significant ice buildup. The issue is, this is the model projection for how much rain will fall. How much of that actually builds as ice accretion is still, uh, again, a bit of a, a question mark, especially when we're taking into factors of the winds and rainfall intensity and of course the temperatures. So uh, everywhere in those areas though where you see from Bonavista Bay through central towards the west coast and the northern peninsula looking at the possibility here of some significant icing. We're going to break down the forecast uh, in detail in terms of when that freezing rain will start to clear up through the day tomorrow. We'll give you that much uh, but a breakdown hour by hour coming up in just a few minutes. Carolyn.
There's a legal dispute brewing between a company in this province and its business partner in China. And it's over the digital currency Bitcoin. Now, last summer, we told you about a new data center that was opening in Labrador to mine Bitcoin. Now, there's a court fight over who owns high-tech equipment there and new details on financial troubles that have affected the Labrador City operation. Here now's Rob Antel has that CBC Investigates story. To keep big computer systems running, it helps to have cool temperatures and cheap power. Labrador has both. Bitmain Technology signed a deal to have its equipment hosted here at a renovated facility in Labrador City owned by Great North Data to mine for bitcoins. But according to court documents, there were problems pretty much from the start financial issues, then operational ones. Finally, in February, an email with bad news. Great North Data was having huge difficulties and was proposing to sell off the equipment so they could then repay Bitmain and get a better deal from a new client. Otherwise, I will not be able to pay my employees or power bills. The two sides couldn't work things out and Bitmain sued last month, looking for damages and to get its equipment back. Great North Data has filed a countersuit for more than a million dollars, alleging breach of contract. Nothing has been proven in court by either side, and a judge has ordered the equipment stay put for now, until a hearing in June. The lawyer for Great North Data says it's business as usual without interruption at its facilities in Labrador. That local company got loans totaling nearly a million dollars from Ottawa and the province to expand in Labrador. Great North Data is in good standing with both. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. The Supreme Court of Canada has ordered that the long-standing Hickman equipment fraud case go to trial. Police began investigating four company managers in 2002. Here now's Glenn Payette has the latest. 150, I have sold it for $100,000. Thank you very much. When Hickman Equipment went bankrupt in 2002, there was a huge auction to sell the remaining heavy equipment to pay off creditors. And around that time, the police began an investigation into alleged frauds involving four company executives, frauds to the tune of about $100 million. A decade later, General Manager Hubert Hunt Vice President of Sales William Parsons, Chief Financial Officer Gary Hilliard, and Sales Manager John King were each charged with 16 fraud-related offenses, including falsifying books, documents, and destroying files. They were supposed to stand trial in January of 2015, but the defense argued that the investigation had taken too long. Justice Carl Thompson agreed, saying it was an egregious violation of their charter rights and stayed the charges. And in a two-to-one ruling last November, our appeals court upheld that decision. Justice Lois Hoyt was the dissenter. She said the investigation was long because it is a complex and complicated case and that it should have gone to trial. Now the Supreme Court of Canada has agreed with her and has ordered the matter to go to trial. And it isn't likely to be a short one. When the case was supposed to go to trial two years ago, it was slated for six months. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. In AHL playoff action, the Ice Caps were on the brink of elimination after losing to the Syracuse Crunch 3-2 last night in New York. Syracuse built up a 2-0 lead in the first period, but Zach Redman and Stefan Matteau netted back-to-back -back goals for St. John's in the second to tie the game. Byron Fraze, though, had the eventual winner late in the period. The Ice Caps are now behind 2-1 in the best of five. The next game is tomorrow night again in Syracuse. Well, after the break, we find out who's cashing in on the so-called geek culture at this weekend's Sci-Fi on the Rock convention in St. John's. And later, we get a preview of the 32nd Arts NL Awards show taking place tomorrow night and see some of the people who will be in the spotlight.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. All right, welcome back. And before we get to some weather, mm -hmm. uh, I got to start with some pretty cool <laughs> video to show you first. The company behind the billion dollar maritime link that'll bring Muskrat Falls power to mainland Canada says crews have started laying a high voltage subsea transmission line between Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Yep, that's right. The work has started. Emira tells us they've already laid about 10 kilometers of subsea cable off Cape Ray. Wow, so how do you lay 170 kilometers of cable on the bottom of the sea? Well, very slowly and very carefully, according to the people doing it. According to Emira, each cable weighs 5,500 tons and together it all weighs more than the Eiffel Tower. Wow, yeah, that's the trivia a, there. It's interesting. Certainly interesting trivia. Yeah. Wow. The underwater tunnels next, folks. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's from Labrador. Oh right, right. right. <laughs> yes. That one first, yeah. and then across <laughs> Nova Scotia. Um, okay, uh, freezing rain warnings. Uh, in case you missed it off the top, I do want to recap where the warnings are in place because we are talking about the significant ice. Mm possibility here anywhere from Bonavista Bay through central uh, back towards the higher elevations of Corner Brook. The rainfall warning is still in effect for Corner Brook and Grossmorn, by the way, but that freezing rain warning extends all the way up the northern peninsula and into the straits. Now look at the highs today. Highs in the afternoon for Labrador, as you would expect for Newfoundland. These highs were this morning and temperatures have really dropped off for this afternoon. In fact, I've uh, made this map up to show you how things progress today. This is 6 a.m. this morning. You can see the periods of rain and note the temperatures in central. Five, six degrees, seven in Cornerbrook, and then watch your timeline. This is as of 9 a.m. Temperatures starting to drop and then really dropping off towards the lunchtime hour where we were at, yes, just the freezing mark uh, for central. 12 degrees in St. John's. And then, yeah, temperatures, wind shift to north, temperatures drop in the metro region back to freezing now. And we are looking at those temperatures that are hovering near and below the freezing mark for central back towards the west coast. Still 9 degrees, Cape Race and St. Lawrence along the Buren Peninsula. And it is all thanks to this frontal boundary. Warm air and southerly winds ahead of it. Northerly winds and the cold air and the freezing rain to the north side of this front and that front will stall through tonight but then slowly wander northward as we move through Friday morning. That will allow the winds to shift back to southerly and that warmer air will creep back in to Newfoundland. We are looking at the uh, that frontal boundary taking its time but will move through Labrador as well through the day on uh, later parts of Friday and by Saturday that front is well to the north and that is going to open the floodgates and allow all of Newfoundland to really warm up for Saturday. We are looking at some scattered shower activity, but also talking about good chance of seeing some sunshine breaking through on Saturday afternoon, central and eastern Newfoundland in particular. And we're also talking about hanging on to some of those warm temps. So we'll have a, some good news for you in the weekend forecast coming up in your long range. There is the snapshot of tomorrow morning. We're starting the day near six in St. John's eight it to five degrees across the south coast. Still hanging on to the freezing rain possibilities. Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor towards the higher elevations of Cornerbrook, especially the northern peninsula back across to Happy Valley, Goose Bay and Labrador City. But as we work throughout the day, that will change and we'll see that warmer air creeping in. We're talking about 10 degrees by 9 a.m. in St. John's, 15 into the afternoon as we see that uh, southerly wind really punch in. Not ruling out a sunny break tomorrow, though I do think the cloud cover will dominate here across eastern Newfoundland. Seven in onshore winds, 13, 14, 15 degrees away from those onshore winds. Bonavista later to warm up uh, with that southerly wind arriving later and your temperature likely peaking near six. There are freezing rain possibilities in central again warming up into the afternoon uh, to as warm as two and three along the north coast but should get to six and seven degrees for inland areas. The south coast again good chance of some scattered showers and drizzle right throughout the day. Seven and onshore winds. I think the port of port region Stephenville the Codroy Valley into the 14 15 degree range tomorrow Cornerbrook near 12 five degrees in the Humber Valley but nine in Grossmorn tomorrow and again the northern peninsula will be cooler. We're looking at the ice pellets and freezing drizzle uh, continuing into the afternoon, peaking near zero there. 
Nice day, quiet for Cartwright. McCovic will be quiet as well. We're looking at some snow and ice pellets for Nain tomorrow and four to as warm as seven degrees with showers taking over in the afternoon in the west. That is your long, yeah, that is your short range and we'll have your weekend details coming up. Second time I've done that this week, Debbie. Getting ahead of yourself there, Ryan. Thanks very much. Well, it's almost time to get your geek on at Sci-Fi on the Rock. The convention begins tomorrow and brings together thousands of fans of science fiction and fantasy. But for a few local businesses, the convention is like an early Christmas. Here now, Zach Gowdy met some of the people cashing in on geek culture. <laughs> My name is John, and we're here at Bricks and Minifigs on Stefanger Drive. We are getting ready for Sci-Fi on the Rock. We're uh, finding figures, sets, minifigures, bulk, anything we can find to bring into the convention. Uh, I'm Shara. And I'm Dave. <laughs> and you're at Midnight Tailors. We make um, casual men's accessories, and um, that kind of ties in with the geek culture. We started off making jackets and like pants and things like that. We kind of thought maybe this stuff will be mostly for the cons and then a scattered thing throughout the year, but we've had people order uh, wedding tie sets that are uh, some form of geek culture. It almost changed our business model a little bit by doing this first, this first I could find the rock we did because we just, we came back from that and we like, this works way better than <laughs> what we had set up. John, why don't you show us what you've got here? Well, we have uh, numerous Lego figures. I, I just went to some flea markets to start with and sold a few mini figures here and there. And, and I was told, you know, you should go to Sci-Fi on the Rock. So uh, on Sci-Fi on the Rock 5 uh, was the first time there. And it was at that point that I realized that maybe this was something that we could take further than just a, a weekend hobby. Is it fair to say that Sci-Fi on the Rock helped to build this store? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't think that we would uh, be anywhere near what we are now if it wasn't for sci-fi on the rock. Star Wars? Well, this is the Star Wars case right here. So, well, I mean, Legos have quite a few different things. There's Star Wars, superheroes, uh, Marvel, Harry Potter. Uh, these are, are things that are very highly sought after in the collectible uh, community. We're all geeks. Everybody's a geek in some way. Everybody geeks out for something. If there's nothing more amazing than going to a convention and seeing someone walk by with the tie they bought last year or the year before. The community comes together. There are different societies that are coming out of it, different groups that started off as people thinking they were the only one who liked a certain item. And now there's communities of 20 and 30 of them that, that have uh, regular gatherings. So it's something that where, where people find other people with the same interests and are able to grow a community. Please, tell me, how am I supposed to do this? Students are putting the spotlight on MUN administrators. The university is under pressure to save money because of government cutbacks and students say raising tuition is not the answer. That's coming up.
Welcome back everyone and now back to our top story. 15 overdoses in two weeks and one young person is dead. Eastern Health raised the alarm today. They're saying that heroin on the Avalon could be laced with fentanyl. That, being, uh, that it is being tested for now. Here's some of what Eastern Health officials and Health Minister John Hagee said earlier today. We would normally see um, uh, intentional overdoses. We see a lot of those. Um, but what's different about this group is um, the patients are all giving very similar stories uh, with respect to what they've used. Uh, and they seem to be all accidental overdoses, which is, uh, which is a little bit uh, out of the ordinary for our population here in the city. So we also want to take the opportunity around um, really overdose awareness and uh, the prevention of overdose. So if somebody were to use an opiate to um, be very careful in terms of what it is that they're, they're taking. If they're going to use, don't use alone or let somebody know where they're using and have somebody check on them. Uh, and then as well to have a naloxone take home kit available to them or to a family member or a friend have it available. Uh, when we are uh, trying to identify what's in the province and, and what sort of uh, issues we might be responding to, uh, we actually have regular contact with the police, uh, with uh, law, law enforcement agencies in St. John's and also Atlantic Canada uh, to see what sort of seizures that they're making. So we do that on a scheduled basis with our, with our office. Uh, when we do identify a, a cluster or an abnormality such as what we uh, have over the last uh, day or two, uh, we, uh, we reach out and contact them. Yesterday actually, um, myself and, uh, and uh, someone with, the, uh, with one of the drug enforcement units, um, we were actually almost trying to get in touch with each other at the same time. We always had a plan. We have had a, an education campaign. Uh, you know, people with addictions are driven by their addiction, whether or not they read the newspapers and, and, and internalize that when you're an addict and you need your next fix. Uh, that becomes the most important thing in your life. So we have to try and get them as opportunities uh, arise. Again, a lot of addicts are in situations where they don't visit primary care providers. They don't go to doctors. So we've put services in urban areas, in drop-in centres, a gathering place, places where you might find folk with these problems would, would uh, gather. We've already done that. Mm -hmm. What you've seen now is the new piece, which is the potentially uh, a spike in overdoses. And again, our concern is that this may have come from adulterated or contaminated street medications. We don't know that yet. We're just working on that principle because it's happened elsewhere. How much of the conversation is with the frontline employees or the frontline healthcare workers who are dealing with this on a, a well, obviously an increasing basis? Well, I mean, that's how we found out. Uh, essentially what happened was the paramedics made the uh, medical oversight on paramedicine and Eastern Health aware uh, and uh, they raised it to the level of the department very rapidly. At the moment it just seems like it's confined to Eastern Health and the urban areas. Uh, we haven't had any reports from anywhere else. We certainly went looking when we heard from Eastern Health. We'll highlight some of the people getting special recognition at tomorrow night's Arts NL Awards show after the break.
Well, this Friday night, the accomplishments of Newfoundland and Labrador's artists will be celebrated at the annual Arts NL Awards. CBC is a presenting partner in the awards ceremony, and our own Angela Angel has been helping produce some of the video profiles honoring the nominees and the winners, and she joins us now. So first of all, Angela, what are the Arts Awards about? So they're an annual event to celebrate our vibrant culture here in Newfoundland and Labrador. There are many artists and arts organizations and groups they're making art and this is the sort of annual reflection on everything they've accomplished uh, and a celebration of the work that they do. And there is so much talent out there to choose from. Uh, how many arts awards are there? So there are a total of four awards with 10 nominees and there are two special awards. So we can have a look at the nominees. So for uh, the Memorial University Arts and Education Award, Corona Brophy and Catherine Wright are the nominees for that award. Chad Stride and Corona Brophy are nominated for the Cox and Palmer Arts Achievement Award. And CBC is the sponsor of the Emerging Artist Award. So the three nominees for that are Eastern Owl, Mel Oates, and Ian Vatcher. And the big award is the Bank of Montreal Artist of the Year Award. And this year, Robert Chafe, Louise Moyes and Opera on the Avalon are nominated for that one. All right, well, congratulations to all of those nominees. Now, there will also be some special presentations uh, you mentioned. Uh, who's being inducted into the Hall of Honor this year? Well, the Hall of Honor recognizes a person or a group who's made a distinguished lifetime contribution to the culture of Newfoundland and Labrador. And, and that honor this year very rightfully goes to choral conductor Douglas Dunsmore, who has inspired generations of conductors and musicians and uh, and I'll let you watch the video that we made about Doug Dunsmore. Douglas Dunsmore found his passion teaching choral music in a Saskatchewan high school in the late 1960s. Since then he's earned a PhD and inspired generations of conductors. Since arriving in Newfoundland and Labrador in 1979, Dunsmore has served as Director of Choral Activities and Interim Director for the Munn School of Music. He's also assumed other leadership roles in national organizations, including the National Youth Choir. Many of his students, such as Kelly Walsh, Chad Stride, Jennifer Hart, and Kira Galway, have become highly successful choral conductors themselves. Dunsmore is a founding artistic director of the International Choral Festival, Festival 500, the founding conductor of Newman Sound Men's Choir and the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra's Philharmonic Choir. He's also the director of the Prince of Wales and Munn Chamber Choirs. He's conducted more than two-thirds of the Messiah performances, one of which was broadcast nationally on CBC. As a volunteer, Dunsmore leads the Gower Street United Church, He's past president of the Association of Canadian Choral Conductors and has performed peer jury duties for Canada Council and the Juno Awards. Douglas Dunsmore's passion for choral music has resonated across the province and the country. A well-deserved honor for sure. And uh, what about the Patron of the Arts Award? So this year's Patron of the Arts is Corner Brooks, Rex Brown, founder of, a co-founder of the March Hare. Well-deserved, and here's a video about Rex. Rex Brown grew up in Tax Beach, Placentia Bay, where students' high school exam marks were posted in the post office window for all to see. Luckily, Brown's marks were good enough to get him into Munn, where he completed a Bachelor of Commerce, a Bachelor of Arts, and a Master's in Philosophy. From 1968 to 1999, Rex Brown taught school in Corner Brook and Deer Lake, and he was the chief writer of the grade eight history text, Voyage to Discovery, a history of Newfoundland and Labrador since 1800. Brown also wrote various curriculum projects for the Canada Studies Foundation, and he was involved with the Provincial Teachers Association. In the late 1980s, Rex Brown combined forces with poet Al Pittman and George Daniels to launch the first March Hare, 
a festival of music and words. The vigorous but humble hare continues with determination to celebrate the province's literary, music and performing talents three decades later. Rex Brown has a deep sense of community and a passion for volunteerism, and though it mightn't be found on the program, the legendary hair breakfast is a gesture of Rex's that goes beyond the call of duty, but speaks volumes about the motives behind his work. True hospitality from a true patron of the arts. So congratulations to Rex Brown and a big thank you to editor Gary Quigley and Joshua Jameson of the Newfoundland and Labrador Arts Council for all their help putting those videos together and they will be shown live at the Arts Awards. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn, before I finish, uh, every year a different artist is selected to make the trophy or the award that's given out and this year's artist is Vesela Brakalova and I just want to show you some of the beautiful mosaic work oh, wow. that uh, will be awarded to the winners on Friday night. Absolutely beautiful. So each winner will receive one of those pieces. Unique original art. Wow. Absolutely beautiful trophies. Well, thank you very much, uh, Angela, and good luck to everyone out there. And, uh, and if you want to watch the Arts Awards show on Friday night, it will air live on CBCNL's Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. Uh, the show starts at 7.30 p.m. Oh, that was great to hear about mm -hmm. all those uh, people nominated, mm -hmm. well-deserved, uh, those special awards. Wonderful. Yep, going to be a nice show, I think. Mm. Yep. How about the weather? How, How nice about is that, that weekend? Be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? We're getting the ice and the messy weather over with and certainly some improvements as we work through Friday. Saturday shaping up to be a pretty decent day across the island. I think Sunday's the money day in Labrador. Let's have a look uh, with the freezing rain warnings that are in effect. Again, we're going to recap this in case you missed it from Bonavista Bay through central to the west coast. Higher elevation areas, generally Cornerbrook, the northern peninsula and the straits. That rainfall warning also in effect for Cornerbrook. And again, anywhere from Bonavista Bay uh, through the north coast, Twillingate, Bay Vert, 10 to as much as 20 millimeters or more of rain with those temperatures at or below freezing. So some significant ice possibilities here. The freezing rain uh, will work northward into the northern peninsula region overnight and in through Friday morning. I don't think the icing will be quite as extensive there, but still significant possibly uh, for you folks through the day tomorrow. Note the uh, winds that will shift here into the Friday afternoon time period back to southerly that will have temperatures on the rise. And uh, despite what this model is showing, I think we will see that uh, rise and, uh, to, of temperatures and a change over to rain in Happy Valley Goose Bay to, for tomorrow afternoon as well. So note your temperatures. Onshore winds will be keeping temperatures as cool as seven. We're at long parts of the coast. Get out of those onshore winds. We're talking about 13, 14, 15 degree possibilities for the Buren, Clarenville and St. John's for tomorrow. Again, cooler in the onshore winds. I think uh, the Codroy Valley up towards uh, Stephenville into the 15 degree range tomorrow. Cornerbrook in the 10 to 12 degree range with those temperatures rising quickly through tomorrow morning. Uh, a little bit later for those temps to creep up for central. So five, six degrees is likely where we're capped tomorrow. We will approach the freezing mark by late day for the Straits in southeastern Labrador, looking at four in Happy Valley Goose Bay and seven by the end of the day in Labrador City. Now that front will continue to lift northward. Watch as we work, work throughout the day on Saturday. We do have scattered shower chances, but also I think especially into the afternoon, some sun breaks here across central and eastern parts of Newfoundland. The cold front then slides through Saturday night into Sunday with some cooler air in behind certainly as we move throughout the day on Sunday. A scattered risk of showers will change to a scattered risk of some wet flurries into the afternoon, especially central towards the west coast. And, but Labrador clears out quite nicely. So here is a look at that forecast in detail for Saturday. Anywhere from 10 degrees along the west coast with those onshore westerly winds to as warm as 14, 15 degrees for central and eastern Newfoundland. Again, away from those onshore winds. We're talking about Scattered showers, but a chance of some sun breaks. And now in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay in eastern Labrador, isolated showers primarily in the morning will clear with some sunshine. Uh, clouds, I think, dominate with a good chance of showers for Lab West. 
on the island for Sunday. Again, the shower chances mixed to a scattered risk of flurries in the afternoon. Again, wouldn't rule out mid to late afternoon the chance of some sun breaks popping in for Newfoundland, but I think the clouds do dominate. Uh, and there is Labrador with sun and cloud cool temps, but a bright day for Sunday. Newfoundland clears out, but certainly cools down Monday into Tuesday. Stem temps start to climb back mid to late next week. And for Labrador, again, a beautiful Sunday into Monday with some mixed precip by mid next week. Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Nathaniel Miller from Grand Falls, Windsor. He's four years old and is a skater with the Sparkling Blades Figure Skating Club in the Can Skate program. Yes, and Nathaniel also plays baseball with the Grand Falls, Windsor Braves Timbits. Hopefully you'll be on the field soon, Nathaniel, uh, weather pending. Congratulations on being <laughs> chosen as today's Young Athlete of the Day. A team of scientists from six countries left St. John's today on a transatlantic voyage that's studying the impact of climate change on the North Atlantic Ocean. The details after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, a large group of people from Nunatsiavut is in New York this week, bringing their message to a world stage. The United Nations is hosting a forum on Indigenous issues, and Indigenous leaders and youth from around the world are there to discuss their common challenges and possible solutions. Here and Now's Jacob Barker has more. In General Assembly Room in New York, this week filled with Indigenous people from all around the globe, a chance for youth and leaders from Labrador to tell their stories and share their issues. Most certainly for other uh, people around the world to hear uh, the Labrador Inuit were, uh, you know, the Labrador Inuit story. This week marked the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Rights. Last year, the federal Liberal government committed to implement it and this year it went a step further. The Declaration's principles of free prior and informed consent are now, and Indigenous knowledge, are now being built into the reforms of reviewing processes for environmental assessment in Canada. 
It's a step in the right direction, but more work is needed by the Canadian government to implement the declaration, Indigenous leaders, including Natan Obed, said after Bennett's speech. I think we don't realize that um, Indigenous peoples across the world are suffering uh, or dealing with the same issues, but just to a different degree. Leanna Rice says she believes there is a spirit within the federal government to implement the declaration. She points towards projects like Muskrat Falls as one example of where it's failed. I think uh, that it's our job as Canadians um, to uh, hold him accountable and hold the government accountable and tell them things uh, like uh, the lever land protectors have been doing. Rice is embracing the opportunity to meet and connect with other Indigenous people from all over the world. She's spoken publicly about the loss of her brother to suicide as well as her own struggles. She says there's common ground and learning from one another can lead to good outcomes. I um, got really emotional when I heard um, the number of countries talking about Indigenous suicide. In a way, nice to hear that we're not alone. Um, and um, there's definitely in the, the next uh, week and a half um, space for me to speak to other Indigenous peoples and see what's working for them and what's reducing suicide rates in um, their parts of the world. The forum continues until May the 5th. Jacob Barker, CBC News. Happy Valley Goose Bay. An Irish research vessel is leaving Newfoundland today with a boatload of scientific equipment and researchers from Europe and North America. The Celtic Explorer is making a transatlantic crossing to study how climate change is affecting the ocean. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Big, beautiful pieces of ancient glaciers like this came to Newfoundland early this year. They were celebrated in media around the world. But the violent storm that brought them here left some people feeling uneasy. The question is, is this just weird weather or part of some long-term menacing changes? Researchers say the evidence is clear. Climate change isn't something that's going to happen, it's something that is happening. So the icebergs might be just one hint of that. Doug Wallace is an oceanographer at Dalhousie University. He says Newfoundland is a climate change anomaly. Air temperatures are rising all around the world, even in nearby Labrador, but they haven't changed much on the island of Newfoundland. The Arctic, of course, has changed dramatically. Most of the rest of the planet has warmed significantly over the past hundred years, but there's a sort of a little region here in the northwest Atlantic where temperatures haven't increased greatly. Some people call it the warming hole. And uh, the reason for that has to do with the behavior of the ocean in this part of the, uh, part of the world. And Wallace says the Atlantic Ocean also has great importance to the whole world. Understanding this part of the ocean is really key to understanding how climate change is happening and how it will uh, happen in the future. The Atlantic Ocean absorbs huge amounts of potentially climate-changing carbon dioxide. Brad DeYoung, a MUN oceanographer who's on this vessel, wants to understand how climate change is affecting that. Knowing how that process is changing is crucial to understanding what is going to happen in 10 years or 20 years as we keep putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Where's it going to end up? Researchers will be on this vessel for the next four weeks, but they'll be making frequent stops every 30 kilometers as they make their way east to Galway, Ireland. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. NASA's Cassini spacecraft phoned home today after being out of contact for nearly 24 hours. The probe temporarily lost contact with NASA while plunging through a gap in the rings of Saturn. Now it's beaming back the information it collected during the trip. Cassini came within 3,000 kilometers of Saturn's clouds. That is the closest a spacecraft has ever been to the planet. It'll take another dive through Saturn's rings next week.
Well, we want to introduce you to this lady, and we're wishing a belated happy birthday to Ellen Gibb of North Bay, Ontario. She is officially Canada's oldest person at, get this, 112. Wow. Ellen has nine grandchildren, 22 great-grandchildren, and 10 great-great-grandchildren. They say their grandmother is very sharp. Her only issue is her hearing. Ellen keeps up her routines, living in her own house, drinking a beer a day, and watching the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> As for her longevity, her family says it's all up to genetics and eating in moderation. A beer a day. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> 112. Wow. Great. Well, a giant chicken egg that was laid in Echo Bay, Ontario, got a lot of attention online last month, and now that egg has cracked open, and what's inside came as quite a surprise. There. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, look at that come out. Right? Oh. Isn't that neat? Look at that. Yes, a second egg inside the egg. Now, the egg was thought to be one of a kind, but now a second giant egg has been discovered in Campbell River, BC, and it was cracked open to reveal what else but another egg. No one knows what's causing the double eggs, but the BC egg owner said it did make for one yummy breakfast. That's enough egg for, a, <laughs> you know, a four egg omelet. <laughs> oh my, how strange. Very. Oh, well, the weather's been strange over the last couple of weeks, but we're finally getting into some warmer air over the next couple of days. Again, warmer spots tomorrow will be southeastern Newfoundland. Oh, out of those onshore winds from the Buren to the Avalon, 13, 14, 15 degrees, and also from the Codroy up into the Port of Port and even Cornerbrook, 12, 14 to 15 degrees potentially there, especially into the uh, Stephenville region. Everywhere else, we're going to be seeing that the temperatures slowly creep above zero as that freezing rain mixes over to a few showers. Wow. This may be the best picture we've seen in weeks. Oh, look. Stunning. Icebergs. Icebergs. The sky and the lighthouse. Fantastic. And this is, of course, a lighthouse keeper Clifford Doran, who I think has the best job in the province. He's <laughs> what of just you? Pumping out the pictures. <laughs> Another great one. Thanks, Clifford. Thank you so much, Clifford. And thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great night and we'll see you tomorrow. Night. Good night, everyone.